Welcome to Conversations Live. For more than a decade, we've brought you the best in books, entertainment, celebrity interviews, and current events. When the movers and shakers of the world have something to say to you, they say it to us first. Here's your host, Cyrus Webb. And welcome back, everyone, to Conversations Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again. For those tuning in in Mississippi on WYAD 94.1 FM and WYADonline.com, we're glad that you all could be with us. Also, those joining us are online affiliates, including our friends at iHeartRadio and Amazon Music Podcast. We're glad to have all of you with us as well. Well, it is a brand new day and a brand new book release for our next guest. We're excited to welcome Professor Claude A. Clegg III to our program. He's celebrating the release of his brand new book called The Black President. Hope and Fury in the Age of Obama. We're going to talk to Professor Clegg not only about the writing and researching for this book, but also the complications that he saw not only, of course, in uh, Obama's presidency, but also his time before and after office as well. If you guys are just now finding out about the book, I'm going to remind you how you can get your own copy of it. Professor Clegg, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Yes, thanks for having me. Well, my state of Mississippi that's listened to us on the radio dial, we make an appearance in this book in not too good of a way, but we'll get into that a little bit <laughs> a little bit later. But, Professor, I want to talk about this journey for you in researching this book. What was it like for you to look at the life and the legacy of, of President Barack Obama? Uh, yes, I'm a historian by training, so we're used to looking at uh, what we write about in the rearview mirror, that is, once the dirt has settled and dust has settled, and we have some historical distance and time from that topic. We write about those topics. So to write about Barack Obama as I was watching his presidency unfold was a really interesting experience for a historian. Uh, that is, I was in a position of writing about something that we hadn't yet had much in the way of historical hindsight about. So that was the challenge and also, I think, the reward of living through history and then trying to think historically about your own times. And today, uh, Professor Clegg, there's a lot of talk about the, the, you know, the partisan gridlock that we see, and people talk about how unprecedented that it is. However, in reading the Black President, we see that it really is not that unprecedented. But also, even as people talk about the infighting taking place uh, in one party or the other, uh, of course, in in the the Biden administration, we see the same thing actually happen sometimes, even in the Obama administration that you were able to show, and in the Congress, even. What was that like for you to see? The the dynamics of even though he had made such history, how really just like things were with him, we see some of the same aspects today. I, I think that, Cyrus, that's one of the major through lines of the book is that uh, what we are seeing today is, you know, the precursor of that is the Obama years and even before that. Uh, the hyper-partisanship, is, I think, is one of the big stories of the Obama presidency and of cer- certainly of 21st century American politics. Uh, especially after the uh, Democrats lost the House of Representatives in the midterm elections of 2010, uh, the sort of resistance to everything that Barack Obama came up with and the Democrats in terms of policy proposals was just striking to see. Now, we saw some of that back in the Clinton years in the 1990s where Newt Gingrich and, and Republicans in the House of Representatives and elsewhere, opposed much of what he was about as well. But I think with the Obama presidency, it was sort of kicked up a notch to the point that you had, you know, a major political party, the Republican Party, not even wanting to pay the bills of the country with raising the debt ceiling, and that we, you know, as a country, went to a, you know, a fiscal cliff uh, in which we almost fell off. We are seeing that same sort of thing, uh, sort of politicking around the question of whether or not the country should pay its bills and that being weaponized by one party, in this case the uh, Republican Party, that's using the filibuster maneuver in the Senate to to make its point uh, in, in politicizing that. But I, I think the hyper-partisanship, uh, the dysfunction, the political dysfunction that we see today, it has its precursor very clearly in the uh, Obama years and before. I think that's so true. And even in the book, The Black President, you even talk about, as again we see in 2021, uh, there you know seems to be some you know some jostling between uh, inside the, the Democratic Party. We see that even in the Black President, what he went with through with the Congressional Black Caucus, trying to get him to do more uh, when it came to issues that dealt. Uh, of course, with with Black Americans, talk to us about that. I mean, again, it, to me, is another interesting parallel, Professor Clegg, about the times that we're in, and also 
uh, the complications that come, you know, when you're in office and trying to to be all things to all people? Yes, uh, a great question. Uh, President Obama is walking a, a tightrope and a number of tight ropes uh, during his presidency. One has to do with race, and it has to do with the fact that his most loyal constituency when it came to who voted for him in the highest percentages was African Americans. Uh, but at the same time, uh, most of those who voted for him were not African American. They were white voters. So how do you speak to both this very loyal constituency of people who voted for you, you know, 90 plus percent, uh, and then uh, at the same time speak to a broader constituency that you absolutely need in order to get elected, and that's not a constituency that is majority black. Uh, so he is walking the tightrope of race and policy. There are those African-American leaders, uh, whether they're in the, the Congressional Black Caucus, whether they're in academia, whether they are um, in the clergy and so forth, who want to see him target his policies towards addressing historical racial discrimination as well as contemporary iterations of racial inequities. Um, and then Obama himself, his his own uh, position is that he couldn't really do that uh, without alienating a good chunk of the electorate, especially the white electorate, that helped him get elected. So instead of the, these sort of targeted things, he went for broad brush policies that at the end of the day might help disproportionately African Americans and those who are most vulnerable. So the uh, best example of that would be the Affordable Care Act, which is this broad brush policy to ex extend the universe of people covered by uh, health care, uh, health care insurance, uh, knowing that those who were most uh, uninsured in the highest numbers, African Americans, Hispanics, and others would benefit most from that. Um, the expansion of Pell Grants was the same thing. Again, uh, on its face, a race neutral policy, uh, but at the end of the day, African Americans and working class, Hispanic, uh, minority uh, students are the ones who benefited most from that expansion of Pell Grants. Same with the expansion of Medicaid and, and so forth. So, uh, again, he's doing a good amount of juggling of um, constituencies and policies and so forth, trying not to alienate, again, black voters who think that much more should have been done for African Americans who were suffering disproportionately in terms of unemployment, uh, wealth loss, foreclosures on their homes, and so forth, um, as compared to others. And... Uh, uh, his own tendency, Obama's own tendency to be pragmatic, uh, to speak to the center, uh, the middle of the electorate, and, of course, the desire to get reelected means that you, you have to be adding people to your coalition and not be involved in subtracting people by uh, a way of alienating folks, uh, especially through targeting benefits and so forth to a particular part of the electorate. The, his, his belief was that uh, to do so, to have targeted remedies that would have helped African-Americans who, by every metric, were doing worse off than most other Americans, but to help them in any overt way uh, would have probably doomed his presidency and his re-election chances. So he's walking a tightrope for the the entirety of the eight years. Right. And I want to say, uh, I mentioned Mississippi makes an appearance in the book, and, and unfortunately not the best way, and that is in the chapter of Second Win, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act, of course, that you know brings up the issue of health care, and of course states like Mississippi, uh, as you talk about in that chapter about uh, black people living in Republican-governed states, uh, how they were not able to benefit uh, from from some of the of course aspects of that because uh, of the way that things were set up and the impact that they had on us the consequences of that that being of course being uh, last in ranking when it comes to infant mortality and also life expectancy stats you know, I want to talk about that aspect of this in in relation to his presidency again and and where we find ourselves in the country Professor Clegg do you hope that this book is a way to not only show us how you know, we all. One of the things, of course, that uh, that President Obama was known to saying to John McCain was, "Elections have consequences." Do you, is that one of the things that kind of stands out to you in this book? They do have consequences, but also the impact they have 
uh, on those living in the 50 states. Oh, oh, absolutely. That's a great point, Cyrus. Uh, elections do have con- consequences, and they're not always the consequences that people foresee. Uh, elections can result in major policy changes, uh, and elections can result in more gridlock and stagnation. Uh, so I, I think that that is one of the big takeaways of the the Obama years. Of course, his election in 2008 really mattered. He had uh, a supermajority in, in the Senate, uh, at least for a moment, uh, which made it possible for uh, the Affordable Care Act to be passed. But if you look across the states, uh, even before the 2010 midterms, uh, uh, but certainly after the 2010 midterms, once the Democrats lost the House of Representatives, and not only did they lose the House of Representatives by like historic margins, but they also lost in local elections and state elections. Again, there was a backlash against Obama and his administration, his policies in 2010. And so states like Mississippi, uh, which are historically Republican, you know, red states, uh, you had states across the country that were flipping to uh, uh, Republican control. So even if you have a White House and a federal government that is pushing a particular policy, uh, those states, uh, especially after 2010, many of them opposed those those policies tooth and nail, whether it was health care, whether it was climate change, uh, and a host of other ways. So elections absolutely have consequences, and not just federal elections for the presidency. I, I would argue that the state elections and the local elections are at least as important in regard to how people, citizens on the ground and in local areas, experience government and experience life and experience policy and so forth. So even as you have the federal government that's trying to expand health care through the Obama administration and, and Democrats in Congress, you have those in the states who uh, are uh, saying that's too far. The, the, the federal government has no right to be involved in the expansion of health care and, and so forth, even as the federal government is footing the bill. In the case of Mississippi, uh, the state was being called upon to foot like 10% of the cost of expanding Medicaid. And uh, Mississippi state legislatures our legislators were saying that even that 10% was too much. You know, we we don't want any part of this expansion of Medicaid, even given the need. You just mentioned the, the last place ranking of Mississippi in terms of infant mortality, in terms of life expectancy. Even in the face of that sort of need, there were those who would rather see the state continue to suffer than to concede that the state might be benefited from federal help, and not just federal help, but federal help from a government led by Democrats. Exactly. It's a powerful book, Professor Clegg. Congratulations to you again, everyone. Professor Claude Clegg Clegg has been our guest. The book is The Black President, Hope and Fury in the Age of Obama. It is out now, so you can definitely get it through our friends at Amazon.com or your favorite local bookstore for sure. Professor Clegg, looking forward to having you back on the program again. Would love to. Thank you so much, Cyrus. Hey, glad to have you. And we thank your audience for tuning in to another great segment of Conversations Live. Until next time, I'm your host, Cyrus Webb, saying as always, enjoy your day, enjoy your life, enjoy your world. Thank you all for choosing Conversations Live. Now let's go make today amazing. Here.